off air. What? Now we're on. We're on. We're live. We're a couple minutes early in case we have any early comers, early arrivals. So if you are, just um, would you do me a favor and just leave a comment and say you're there because I need to figure out the Q&A thing and I'm not very, uh, this is the first time I've used the Q&A thing. So if you're there, just say hi and um, maybe, oh, here, Harry's there. Okay, Harry is there. Great. Harry is an early bird. Harry? Yeah, but I didn't. I'm Okay, so it's not. I'm going to have to check the comments when uh, to make sure everybody's there, well, uh, to make sure questions are coming in. Yeah, Harry, if you have a comment or a question, um, just put it in the comments section, and I'll check, um, you know, every so often. Anyway, it's 7 o'clock, so let's get going, and welcome to the Top Suspense Hangout. Um, I'm Libby Hellman, and with me are Lee Goldberg. Say hello, Lee. Hi. <laughs> and Paul Levine. And I'm also going to say hi, but I'm going to do it in a much more long-winded fashion than Lee because otherwise people won't know that I'm here. And hello, Lee, and hello, Libby, and hello, Harry, and anyone else who's joining in. Well, we were supposed to have Joel Goldman with us, and unfortunately he couldn't make it. Um, so we're really sorry, but maybe he's tuning in, and maybe he. I, we still have the invite out to him, so maybe he'll be able to join us. Do you think us. he has wireless access at the strip club he's at? <laughs> I don't know. I think I think he was probably having a better time than we are. Anyway, um, we are three of the 12 members of the Top Suspense group. We are all crime fiction, thriller, horror, mystery writers. And um, before we go any farther, I wanted to um, show you who else is in Top Suspense. And let's see if I can do this. Um, I have to... Uh, take that off. Okay, now let me see if I can do this. Here. Um, this um, is the thrill of modern communications in the <laughs> internet. Listening to someone fumble their way across the computer. All right, here this we go. There we go. That's beautiful. Libby, excellent Ooh. job. That's okay. the group. That's the group. It, um, we, you can see we have Max Allen Collins and Bill Kreider and Stephen Gallagher from the UK and Joel and Ed Gorman, the wonderful Ed Gorman and the very sexy erotic Vicki Hendricks and Naomi Hirahara. And now how come she's the only one you describe as sexy? You don't think Stephen <laughs> Gallagher is sexy? You don't think I'm unbelievably hot? <laughs> I'm offended. I'm leaving this Google Hangout. <laughs> no, it, but it's Paul because he's five. Never mind, I won't go there. And Dave Zeltzersman, who's the person who brought us all together in the first place. Um, you, know, you, know you know what strikes me, Libby, about the group, and and, you, and we could expound on it a little bit, is how geographically diverse we are from Los Angeles with Lee and Harry and used to be me. Uh, to London and Stephen Gallagher and Dave up in the Boston area and uh, um, Joel who's at the strip club in Kansas City um, and and who else who else fill it fill it in Bill Kreider in Texas right and Ed Gorman in Iowa he's my neighbor and Max yeah. is in, Max is in Iowa too right they're very close to each other um, and well, what we all have in common is we write mysteries thrillers Suspense, in the case of Ed and Bill Kreider, Westerns, Dave Zeltzman writes horror. We basically cover the wide range of thrilling types of fiction. None of us is writing really literary fiction or romance. We're writing a basically crime-oriented, violence-oriented fiction, stuff that <laughs> grabs you narratively by the throat and shakes the money out of you. Which is exactly what we want to talk about tonight, is how we do that. Uh, to other, so other people might pick up a few tricks or tools or techniques. So let's start out. Um, who wants to go first? How would you define suspense? Go ahead, Lee. Oh, God, I was hoping you'd go first. Because um, I, I really don't know what the heck I'm doing. Um, I would define oh, wait, wait, suspense. Before, I have to interrupt you. It's Lee's birthday tonight. 
So um, I just turned 21. I'm finally able to drink alcohol. It's a big deal for me. I'm hoping to get lucky as well, but don't don't ruin it for me by. You won't tell your wife. About you, know, it. you know the truth about Lee is that by the time he really was 21, I think he'd written three novels or something. Lee that is true. five actually. Oh, five. But Lee who's is bragging? One. Okay. Um, so you asked about suspense. Yeah. I would say suspense is a a building or escalating sense of apprehension or fear heading towards an uncertain conclusion or a certain conclusion. It's it's you the audience may know that there's a giant monster at the end of the tunnel and our heroes are heading towards it or it's a ticking clock of what the hell is going to happen we don't know what's coming. But it is an escalation, a building of pressure towards an uncertain or horrifyingly certain conclusion. It's a it's a thrill ride. It's going up that, to use a horrible cliche, it's going up the roller coaster knowing the drop that's on the other side or not knowing the drop that's on the other side. And it's difficult to, um, to create in a book. I mean, in some ways it's easier to do visually in television. Paul and I both are, are active in the world of TV, and I think it's harder in a book to create that sort of tension um, purely with words and playing with people's imagination. Whereas on a TV show or a movie, you can show them things um, that they wouldn't otherwise know about in a book, if that makes any sense. No, it does make sense because uh, in film, you, you don't really have a point of view. I mean, you're, you're at the audience's point of view the entire time. But in a novel or a book, you have to be in a character's point of view. But at the same time, the audience has to already know what's going to happen. So that the audience will will be able to say, no, don't go into that room. The bad guy's there. He's going to get you. Well, I don't know what I can add to that. I was going to say that suspense takes you on a roller coaster ride of emotions, but then Lee called that a horrible cliche. So <laughs> I just really took the wind out of my sails to use a, another cliche. But yes, yeah, suspense builds. Uh, um, inevitably to a third act conclusion since we all still write primarily in the three act structure that Aristotle gave us back when I was a young man um, and you want the reader or the viewer to keep asking what happens next I can't wait to find out what happens next I've got to turn the page or in the case of a movie or my favorite new television show we were discussing off air, True Detective. My goodness, you know, what's going to happen next? In some ways, let's be honest, creating suspense is like good sex. It's really hot foreplay. It's building towards this wonderful climax. You're not sure how it's going to be, but you're building towards it. Basically, <laughs> action adventure suspense is a way to have sex without having sex. Well, I think it is sex on a roller coaster. There you I think go. it's a little more difficult. Maybe that's because I'm a different gender. Um, but I will. But it's also say conflict. It's also establishing ahead of time different kinds of conflict and establishing a ticking clock of some sort. A ticking clock that exacerbates the conflict either within a person or between two characters, and that's an essential part of of suspense. It's the kindling that creates suspense. It's the conflict between two characters and the outside force or outside pressure that makes that conflict even greater, and then boom, you have the inevitable, scary, frightening, exciting, climactic, erotic, wonderful explosion. Okay, yeah. so let's, let's go a little bit underneath that, these definitions. How, what are some of the techniques that you use to build suspense in your work? Well... You know, Specific, like in you know, talk about one of your books or a, a scene in one of your books, and actually, let me stop you. I just realized that the audience who's watching us, Harry and my mom, actually my mom's dead, so <laughs> my mom's old next door neighbor, is that no one knows who we are. We should probably say who we are, what we've done, what we've written, so they know that what we're talking, that we know what we're talking about, or at least we can fake what we're talking about. Yeah, you know, I don't see your um, your thing. Your your overlay your your do you see it Paul do you see Lee's uh, Lee's has disappeared but we could tell everybody to, to go to LeeGoldberg.com to learn more but Lee why right. don't you, Lee, why don't you Lee talk about that. yourself a moment I know as embarrassing as that is for you and as shy as you are in person uh, very seldom leaving ah there it is uh, leaving home 
tell us about yourself, Lee. Uh, let's see. I'm a Edgar-nominated, Seamus-nominated mystery writer and thriller writer. I've written hundreds of hours, written and produced hundreds of hours of TV, including Diagnosis, Murder, Hunter, Monk, Sequest, Very Watch, um, <laughs> and a bunch of other shows. And I've written uh, dozens of novels, including the Monk novels, the Diagnosis Murder novels, the Dead Man series for Amazon Publishing, King City, and I am the author of the New York Times, co-author of the New York Times best-selling novels, you can't even see it on camera, The Chase and uh, The Heist with Janet Ivanovich. When does that come out? Uh, the Chase comes out next week, and The Heist came out uh, back in June and jumped to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, which was a real thrill. I'm still using smelling salts and just thinking about it. Yeah. But basically my entire career has been made up of writing suspense or crime in one form or another. And I've just scared Paul away. He's left the room. <laughs> well, Lee had this wonderful visual prop, which of course I didn't think of, and I thought I should then probably... Oh, that is a good idea. Hold up a book. I don't know if you can see it, but that's State versus Lassiter, which is my most recent novel came out in the fall, um, which is the tenth in a series of legal thrillers. I love this. Our host leaves the room. He's in an empty chair. When does Jeez. Jimmy Fallon leave the room? <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Libby's getting a book to hold up what too. What kind of, of hangout there, is this? I mean, before it's not you came like, on, she had like somebody's, you know. Scrotum or something hanging on the bulletin board behind her. Now, in the middle of the interview, she leaves the room. You're not supposed to. I thought I was working with that. professionals. I'm going. You're not supposed to tell people that. If we were professionals, we would now be cutting some video over our voices or a little trailer or something. But we instead. We have B roll over us, but okay. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I, I was going to say that before the other Edgar-nominated author, Lee Goldberg, interrupted me, that uh, I wrote 10 novels featuring a uh, ex-Miami Dolphins linebacker turned night school lawyer named Jake Lasseter um, many years ago. Only, only Lee would remember there was a television movie based on one of the books. Um, it never went to series. Um, I wrote a series, or write a series called Solomon vs. Lord, so set in Miami. Uh, I spent a few years writing episodes uh, for JAG, the old CBS military show, and uh, co-created a show that was a spectacular failure called First Monday, which was set at the Supreme Court, lasted 13 episodes, um, which had a very good cast, uh, James Garner, Joe Mantegna, Charles Durning. And I like to refer to it as the Emmy-nominated show because, in fact, the theme music was nominated for an Emmy. And that's my story. Okay. And I've written ten novels. Um, they're all crime fiction. Um, four in one series, three in another, and then three standalones um, of which, and this is what I was gone, Lee. I wanted everyone to see my most recent one, which is called Havana Lost, and it takes place mostly in Cuba during the revolution that brought Fidel Castro to power. So that was kind of fun to write also. Um, but let's get back to suspense. Um, what are some of the techniques, or, or just name one technique that you use to build suspense in your writing? You know, Lee referred to something I'm going to pick up on when he said maybe it's easier on the screen to build suspense. One of the techniques that you use on the screen that you can also use, and all of us do in, in uh, our novels, unless the novel is in first person, is to cross cut. You go in one scene from the hero in, or heroine in his or her dilemma and cut to the villain and cut back and forth. And maybe uh, each of them is going to the same place. Uh, maybe the villain to use the worst cliche, is kidnapped the victim and the hero is fighting the ticking clock to rescue her. Um, and you cross-cut between them. That's one technique. Okay, Lee, something? I, I agree with, um, with Paul. By doing the cross-cutting in third person, you can 
you can hide some information from the reader or share some information from the reader that other characters share information with the reader that other characters don't know. You can control point of view to create suspense. But when you write a book in first person, the essential element of suspense is understanding the conflict within the lead character. You have to establish who he or she is, what they want, what they're afraid of, what they stand to lose, and then create a situation where all those fears and, and risks come to a head. So if you are in the heart and soul of that hero or heroine, and you see the events coming that are happening around him or her, you, you feel the suspense that they feel, that you would feel in the same situation if you had those same emotional problems, those same conflicts, those same, the same history. So there it's a manipulation of the information you share about your hero combined with the conflict you put them in that's going to make that information have relevance. Um, that's a harder thing to pull off. Suspense, I believe, is much easier to do third person than it is first person. And I think suspense is even easier in a, in a screenplay than in a, um, in a book. I, I, I think what you're kind of talking about is raising the stakes. And I like to, when I do workshops on suspense, I talk to people and I tell them how much they, they have to raise the stakes. And I, and I, I use this, um, I say, have you ever had an editor or someone reject your work and just say, well, the stakes aren't high enough or it's just not compelling enough? Well, what does that really mean? It means that there's not enough of an emotional investment by the reader in the situation. So... And you you were both talking about that by you know talking about how you know the audience has to get or the reader has to get really involved and really has to um, root for the good guy or maybe they're rooting for the bad guy I don't know by raising the stakes by making the worst thing by by you know finding out what the worst thing is and then making it happen. But you got to be careful that you're not going with easy conflicts. It's easy to have someone with a gun walk in. It's easy to have a hurricane or an earthquake or, you know, a monster. You want, those are cheap conflicts. The best conflicts are the ones that truly come from character. A, a cliched version would be the guy who's afraid of heights and has to go up to a high building to rescue someone. Or is, you We're want conflict that, that is based on character, not conflict that, can be arbitrarily applied to anyone and would work for anyone. You want conflict that is unique to the characters that you are writing about. That's how you're going to invest the audience in what happens to them. Not if it's a conflict that is wholly exterior and um, homogenous, if you know what I mean. It's a, it's a conflict that anyone would find. Uh, well, it's like a, a guy um, being forced to take a drink after he's been sober for 10 years. Or even a, a dilemma like... Um, having to kill one person and trying to save two people, but knowing you can only save one. Which but in a way, no, I mean, no disrespect. The, the, con the conflicts you're mentioning, in a sense, are generic because, you can, because it works for these kind of, this kind of example. It's hard to come up with one without describing in depth the character, but take, for instance, Adrian Monk. Here's a guy who has an obsessive-compulsive disorder, who's afraid of germs, relationships. So there's a huge amount of situations you could put him in that would create conflict and suspense just for him and nobody else. And that's, to me, the ideal sort of conflict. Conflict that we couldn't use in, like, the example you just did of having to choose between which one of your children will be assassinated or, you know, that kind of thing. Because those are conflicts that can be grafted upon any of us. To me, the truly best conflicts are the ones that are unique to the character or story that you're telling, which we so, could use. So, example. Lee, to create conflict between you and me right now, are you criticizing the plot of Sophie's Choice? Uh, with, <laughs> no, with, no, with no, no, no. Example. And when you said the cliché of the fear of heights, um, the heart, that cliché, you're are criticizing, uh, and then the guy's got to go up in the roof, you're criticizing the plot of Vertigo. But Vertigo um, has become a cliché. Rear windows become a cliché. Those were great the first time you saw them. Now you look at them and go, oh, Christ, this guy's so uncreative, he's doing vertigo again. Right. Yeah, but you do. But I, it, it gets me every time. I mean, they're, they're, we were just talking about House of Cards before we went on the air. And 
the suspense in that, you know, I know what they're doing, I know how they're planting it, I, and, I, and it still gets me. I'm still glued to the screen. What's going to happen? What's going to happen next? Are they going to get away with it? And that, that to me, I mean, if it, if it grabs you... But that's... You're, you're proving my point. Those are machinations unique to the characters and situations of House of Cards. You take them out of that context of who Frank Underwood is and the other characters, they don't have any meaning. But within that world, of unique characters, unique conflicts, characters striving for unique goals, it is suspenseful and exciting. Well, um, it would be hard to argue against that point, that good suspense and good conflict comes out of unique and wonderfully created characters. I'm going to have to agree with that. Okay. Uh, but may, let me ask a question. Um, I, my mind is still stuck back when we were talking about point of view. Um, it seems to me there used to be a rule, if there are any rules in writing novels, that you don't go shifting points of view in a scene. And I know I adhere to that, but I've read many books in more recent years when authors seem to willy-nilly change their view between characters in a scene without giving some indication that they're doing so, like in a ellipsis across the page, and I have found it confusing. What about you guys? I, I think that's bad craft. I, I, you know, I don't care if the scene is only one paragraph or if it's five pages, but you have to be in one person's point of view throughout that scene. Unlike a film where, you know, you're, it's sort of omniscient point of view the whole way because, you know, of camera angles and who you're focusing on. Well, I would disagree only to, I mean, I agree with everything you guys are saying, but I think even in film there's point of view. The director has chosen a point of view. Even if it's, though you're seeing everything, you are experiencing the scene through a particular character's uh, viewpoint, or the editor picks a point of view. Um, so yes, while it may be an omniscient camera, I think there is, just what you described in a book, a point of view in each, in each scene. And I agree with you, Libby, that it's bad craft, the people who jump in and out of people's heads on a single page. Um, I think it's great to jump around, but you need to have a distinct uh, separation between it. You can't have someone talking and be in their head, then the next person talking and be inside their head in the same scene. That's just clumsy writing. Uh, and confusing to the reader, I would say. Uh, let me tell you the one technique that I use. We talked about um, we talked about writing from third person point of view. We talked about first person. I I've, I've used a hybrid in my Solomon versus Lord novels where uh, I will write one chapter from Steve Solomon's point of view and then chapter two is from Victoria Lord's point of view and keep going back and forth throughout the novel. In first person. In first, in first person, yeah. yes. And um, I, I find it, well I agree with Lee that it's really much easier to create suspense with third person and cross-cutting and all of that, which you can't do, in either first person or this hybrid that I'm discussing, boy, it really helps you get deep into the characters to write in first person. And now, by, by this cheat that I'm doing or this little kind of fun thing that I'm doing, I'm able to get deep inside the two co-protagonists. At least, I hope that's the way it works out. Yeah. S.J. Roseanne does that. I think Dick Lockie did it in his Sleeping Dog uh, novel. In... Um, the Chase and the Heist, the Fox and O'Hare series that Janet Ivanovich and I write together, it's third person, but I would say it's primarily from the point of view of Kate O'Hare, this FBI agent who's teamed up with Nick Fox, this con man. But at the same time, we do go to other people's points of view, the point of view of the bad guy who's being conned, the point of view of other people in the, the con artist team. What we rarely do is go in the head of our con artist, Nick, Nick Fox, because we want to have some surprises about how the con is crafted and how it unfolds and how much truth he's telling and how much he's withholding. So while the book is in third person and jumps around, essentially it is in first person. It is from Kate O'Hare's point of view. So there's some distinctions, I think, between first and third person, yet also some similarities where you can make third person essentially omniscient first person. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I, I wrote four books from first person, and I had to stop because um, there were other characters whose heads I wanted to get in. And so I, I then went to third person, and I pretty much stayed there. 
Um, but, but having said that, I'm just about to start a first-person book again after writing seven, six books without it. So. I did 15 monk novels, first-person, from Natalie Teeger, monk's assistant's point of view, from a woman's point of view. And I think that's the only way you can tell a story where the central character is crazy like Monk. You don't want to get inside his head. You want to have the fun of experiencing him the way the people around him do. You don't want to have the mystery of that character taken away from you, much like you know, Nero Wolf or Sherlock Holmes. But it, like you said, Libby, it's limiting. I was glad after the 15th Monk novel to get back into third person and be able to see what other people were thinking and doing and to look at a story from other perspectives to have a better ability to create the suspense we're talking about. And yeah. then, and yet, humor too. It, it was brilliant, if I may say so, uh, for you to have written those books from the point of view of the sidekick instead of from the point of view of the hero. I stole it from Nero Wolfe and, and Sherlock Holmes. Right. It just seems that's the way to deal with an eccentric character. You don't want to be an eccentric character's head because he's, then he's not eccentric anymore. You want right. to experience him the way other people do, trying to figure out what the hell is he thinking? Why is he doing that? What's going on in that head of his? Hey, let, me, let me ask you another question. This is a little off the track of suspense, but as long as we're talking about point of view, how do you decide which characters to, to get into their head, which characters to go into their point of view, and which not? Well, obviously, you're a hero or a heroine, and I would say almost always, but there would be some reasons not to, you're a villain. Okay, um, what do you think about... I, I read a lot of books where something somebody's we're in somebody's head for one short chapter and then they die. I mean, it, was that a cheap trick or was that solid writing? You got to have a dramatic narrative reason for doing that. Um, I always think what is going to be the most fun? What's going to show off my heroes to their What's going to move the plot forward in an interesting way and reveal more character and conflict in my heroes? Whose point of view? And I have to ask myself that every time I write a scene. Whose point of view is going to serve this scene best and serve the story best and create the most conflict? And sometimes that means to a, a sidebar character, a security guard in a museum, it might be more fun to see what that security guard is seeing of our two heroes than to be in our heroes' heads. Or maybe it's more fun for the con to be in the head of the person being bamboozled than in the heads of the bamboozlers. So literally, I sit and I look at my outline and I think about what will be the most fun. And sometimes I make the wrong decision. I'm writing and I realize, no, 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 no. I'm in the wrong point of view. i got to be in this other guy's point of view. Even though we've never met him before, that's where the fun is. And in seeing my characters as he sees them. Yeah. It's so when you're outlining, Lee, if I could toss out a question, you're outlining story plot, but not necessarily point of view until you get there and knowing everything you know up to that point in the story, you say, whoops, let's take a look at this from an outsider's point of view. I make some choices in the outline, but I don't feel married to them. An outline, to me, is not etched in stone, to use a cliche. I like to think of my outlines as living outlines. I finish my outlines about a week or so before I finish the book. My outlines are always changing to incorporate changes I've made in the book that I'm writing. So I, I rewrite my outline every couple of days. So I have a binder right here next to me that I call my living outline. And it's you know constantly being revised. And then over here, I have my printout of the manuscript. And it's the book is finished just a little while after the outline is finished. In a sense. Now I know I, why you wrote about Monk. <laughs> that's, that's very uh, detailed. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't even do an outline. Oh, that's a whole, we could do a whole hour on <laughs> that. Um, you must be, you, your brain, Libby, must be able to hold more matter in a structured way than mine. I, no, I have just to. very linear. <laughs> I, See, I, I find if I'm doing a mystery, you know, a complex mystery that only Monk can solve, I better have all my clues here and know how I'm going to parcel them out. In the Fox and O'Hare books, Janet and I are writing very complex, twisty cons. I need to know all the steps and the, the diversions and everything of the con. Um, also, I've been trained to write outlines. I come from TV. And in television, you have to write a detailed outline that the network and studio have to approve. Then while you are writing the script, there are people 
finding locations, casting actors, ordering wardrobe based on your outline. So it got me in the habit of writing outlines, but it, it, for my books, I don't write super detailed ones, and I don't, I don't stick to them. I, I sh you know, change awesome. them as I go. It's worked for you. Let, let's go back to a little bit more on technique. Um, when you start a book, what is one of the things that, do you have anything in your head when you're writing the first chapter? What is, how are you going to start? My f big thing in writing the first chapter is I don't want them to put the book down. I want to hook them. This first chapter had better be a grabber because they may read the first chapter as a sample on their Kindle and decide, oh, no, I'm not buying the book. They may read it standing in a you know, bookstore. Or even if they've already bought the book, if that first chapter doesn't grab them enough to keep them sitting in their subway chair or in the airplane or whatever, I fail. So I have to write a compelling, well, it's like the first act of a TV show. You want to keep them after the commercial. It, it just better be a grabber. And I don't mean big explosions or a sex scene or a car chase. You have to have a in compelling process with interesting characters. You have to start in the middle of the action, though, right? I tend to always start in the middle because that way you can have things unfold and reveal by showing, not telling. Exposition is the depth of conflict and humor and drama. Absolutely no backstory, right? No. Not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. I'm no, just talking about not, beginning. not in the beginning. I've broken that rule. I mean, the, the monk books tend to open with some exposition that, you know, I'm Natalie Teeger and my boss is crazy. And if you look at the Kinsey Milhone Sue Grafton books, they generally start with her saying, I'm Kinsey Milhone, um, I have a wrinkled dress, and I, I am an investigator working for an insurance company in Santa Teresa. She can well, do but to underline what Lee just said, um, and you touched on it, people, yes, always stood in the aisle in the bookstore and looked at the front cover, looked at the back cover, maybe they read the flap copy, and now they're going to read those first couple of pages. With, with Amazon, and the ability to get a free sample of the book, that's really your sales tool. I mean, it's much bigger and more important than ever. So I would say not just the first chapter has to be a great tease and a great builder of suspense and a great I want to know what happens next, but your first three pages have to be. And when I look back at some of my early books uh, written in the early 90s with a prologue, now pro nothing wrong with a prologue as long as the prologue still follows the rules we're talking about, but I wrote some that didn't. And I just don't even know how I got away with it. Um, but you got to, you, you do, you're off to a running start these days. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the other end of the chapter, where you know a lot of people you have, you have the ability to to write a cliffhanger if you want. Right. How often should you do that? Every chapter, if you can, but you can't always. Uh, I love to do that. I love to end it with something that that poses a question or a situation or a moment of conflict that has to be resolved, hopefully on the next page, meaning turn to chapter seven from the end of chapter six and and keep it keep it flying. I agree with Paul. I try to end not on a straightforward cliffhanger, but exactly what he said, an emotional moment, a funny moment, a something that keeps you wondering what's going to happen next, to, to give you a reason to turn the page and keep reading. Um, I think that's inherent, or, or it's required now in today's short attention span world that we have, that you have to keep the, the reader hooked, and you've got to give them a, an incentive to keep going on, and that incentive is to find out what happens next. And mm -hmm. if you end on exposition and you end with a finality in each chapter, it's almost like a door slamming. Yeah, and it's also very old-fashioned, I think. You know, Lee, and Libby, but Lee, because you work so long and so well in television, what I learned in writing for television that really helped me when I went back to the novels after a hiatus of several years was to keep up pace, was to streamline my dialogue, and one of the ways that it's actually proven to me statistically, you know, on your computer, how you go in and when you get 
on the word count page, you can also find what is the length of your average sentence. My sentences have gotten shorter. Yeah. I've, uh, and to a certain extent, the books have gotten a little shorter as I've written at a quicker pace, as I've written a quicker pace story, I should say. Well, I have found that TV has trained me to think in terms of act breaks. You know, what's my act one break? What's my act two break? What's my act two twist? What's my, my hook in act three? What's, so even though I'm not writing TV, my books tend to have a four-act structure in a way. You know, I, I can actually feel the structure in there, and that helps me write. I'm aware of, okay, I'm now hitting the first act break. If I have a 400-page manuscript, essentially each 100 pages is, is an act, and I try to have a big act two twist, and the stakes dramatically increasing in act three, and it's, so it, it's, it's helped my writing enormously, my TV experience. Do you put a commercial at the end of each act? <laughs> no, I don't do that. Then you're, okay, well, you, you didn't learn everything then. No. Um, yes. I, I kind of follow the three-act structure, and at this point, because I've written so many novels, it's it's kind of intuitive. I I know what I'm. I just know when I'm getting to the end of the first act, and I'm, and if things haven't ramped up, boy, they have to really something really exciting has to happen, and then I go into the second act, and the same thing. At the end of the second act, there has to be something that takes me into home stretch. So. For for people um, not familiar with the three-act structure, which, as I said, comes to us from Aristotle, um, one of the simplest and best uh, definitions of it I've ever heard was Act 1, you put your hero in a tree. Act 2, you throw stones at your hero. Act 3, you bring your hero down from the tree. Here's how Dead I or alive. Dead or alive. For, for me, I, I like Libby in a sense, I have told so many stories in the four-act structure because of television, hundreds of stories, that I think in the four-act structure, I can't help it. And for me, the four-act structure goes something like this. There's the tease. There's the hook. There's you know, the Starship Enterprise flies in outer space, and there's a giant octopus there. Bum, 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 bum. And you stick around to find out how the Enterprise is going to deal with this giant octopus. Act one sets up who all the characters are, what the stakes are, if, they're gonna, if they succeed or fail. It basically sets up everything that they're trying to achieve and all the obstacles to them achieving it. And then something really bad happens that ups the stakes at the end of Act 1. Act 2, again, whether it's a mystery, a doctor show, a science fiction show, Act 2 is the heroes come up with a plan, an approach to solve their problem, to save the world, to rescue the people, to discover the murder, and they put that plan into action, and it's going great, and then everything turns to crap. At the end of Act 2, everything they thought they knew was wrong. The guy they thought was a killer isn't. The thing they thought would cure the patient doesn't cure the patient. And every, there's no way they can win. Everything they thought they know is wrong. They're screwed. Act 3 is essentially the heroes recovering from the calamitous events at the end of Act 2, trying to come up with a new approach, a new way of dealing with things, but in the midst of this, everything keeps getting worse. The stakes raise, the pressures increase. By the end of Act 3, there is no way in hell they'll win a conviction, they'll save the girl's life, they'll find the murderer, they'll stop the giant planet-eating octopus. They're screwed. <laughs> Act 4, they put a new plan into action, and they solve the problem. They catch the murderer, they stop the giant planet-eating octopus, they save the girl's life, and by the end of Act 4, equilibrium is restored and everything is back essentially the way it was at the beginning of Act 1 if you're doing a series, and they're ready to face a new conflict. Well, and, and I it, find that that's essentially the pattern of every great I, drama that's on TV or even great book that I read, crime novel anyway. Yes, but you're talking about it as four acts because, because of the television uh, yes, commercial. Yes, essentially the three-act structure with Act well, 2 cut in half. Your Acts 2 and 3 are really Act 2 in the classic structure, and at the end of Act 2, or your Act 3, um, as Steve Cannell used to say, Act 2 ends, in the three-act structure, with the destruction of the hero's plan. The destruction of the hero's plan. The hero is at his or her lowest point, and as Lee just said, oh, it's not going to turn out well. Act 3, the resolution, um, it's either going to turn out well, or like Chinatown, it's going to have a really horribly downbeat ending. You know what? <laughs> you, you just you just um, 
predicted what I was going to say because I was going to say the big choice that I have now is whether to have the hero be a hero and everything ends okay or whether to make it a lot more noir and end it, you know, pretty badly. And I've been playing around with both. I've been doing both much more. I, I've been getting much darker, more noir as I go on. I'm not sure why. But. Well, it's uh, we, a philosophy question. It's funny. Last night I was watching a movie from the 90s, um, seen several times, Al Pacino and Carlito's Way. Which oh, is yeah. With a long, long chase scene in the subway and Grand Central Station as the mafia bad guys are coming to try to kill Al Pacino, uh, who is trying to go straight and, and literally take a train out of town with the woman he loves. Um, and here's a big spoiler alert for a 1983 film. Um, and after Pacino in Grand Central Station shoots and kills all four of the mafia thugs who are coming to get him, boom, out of the shadows pops another bad guy from earlier in the show who shoots him three times in the stomach and he and the hero dies. Thank you very much. Okay, enough. Let's go, you know what, we have some comments from the from people who are watching. Uh, three people have wished you happy birthday, Lee. Thank you very much. I don't know who they are. Somebody else um, how, hopes Joel is okay. And he he's in a strip club. club. How bad could he be? He's, he's probably having a better time, like than we are. Um, somebody wanted to know who we were and why they should watch this hangout. I, I would agree completely with that guy. <laughs> and that's about it, I guess. Uh, you know, so, um, Harry says, isn't suspense part of good storytelling? Absolutely. Even in a romance, you want suspense. Absolutely. Even in an animated film, you want suspense. Without suspense, you have no tension. So yes, you always need some form of suspense. It's just a question of how larger role the suspense plays in in the story you're telling. And you also need conflict in virtually every genre, including literary fiction. Yes. Well conflict is is what we start out with, even yes. if a character even if it's internal. Wants, even if a character just wants a glass of water and can't get it. I'm still wondering about that question from the guy who said, Who are you people and why should I be watching? How did he get here if he didn't know who we are? I don't know. Just like skimming Google, looking for people who are hanging out. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know. You know, this is this is our first time. So the reason you should watch us, young man, is because <laughs> I'm a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> and it's his birthday. Yes. And a New York Times best-selling author. And a New York Times best-selling author. Oh right, that too. Okay. But that doesn't have a lot of currency in my house. With my wife, it's hey, New York Times best-selling author. Put the toilet seat down. It doesn't go down by itself. Hey, New York Times bestselling author. You laundry up. She's great. Valerie's terrific. Okay. Um, one. Anybody else want to make some comments? Because we're almost. Uh, any concluding comments? We're almost at 7:45. We're I mean at 45 minutes, and we probably should let all these good people go. You want to say anything, Lee or Paul? Just want to say. It's always a pleasure to talk shop with you and uh, and Paul. Yeah, it is fun. We should do it again. Same here. Good night, everybody. But without that guy who doesn't know who the hell we are. Oh, we stop. It's been oh, fun. Yeah. I hope yeah. we've been helpful. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank you, everybody, for watching. And um, we will definitely answer questions or more comments if you want to put them in the comments section of the event. Um, we'll get back to you. So thanks a lot. Oh, and, and we'll visit our website, www.topsuspense.com. Or That's you can reach any of us at the websites you see at the bottom of our screen here. Yes. Yes. yes Thank you, Lee. You Top can... Suspense, you'll see um, all 12 authors and like eight or nine of our titles. And um, believe me, if you start reading them, if you haven't already, you'll be, go you'll be satisfied for another six months. <laughs> and good night, everyone. And as Vince Scully says, good night, everybody. Good night.